All right, I appreciate you guys coming out today. Um, so show of hands, how many folks know about uh, North Carolina Wildlife Federation? All right, a little bit. All right, so the uh, organization has been around for about 75 years, and uh, they're part of the National Wildlife Federation. So if any of you guys read Ranger Rick as a kid, uh, that's the uh, raccoon mascot they have. Uh, we have the Matthews chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, uh, which was the first chapter in North Carolina. Now we've got almost 20 chapters around the state. I'll show you a map a little later on in the presentation. But uh, uh, we do this type of thing. Um, we teach people about various uh, animals. I mean, it's mostly wildlife oriented, but we've had interesting presenters that, uh, you know, we're all interconnected. Everything's interconnected. So the mycelium and mushrooms are interconnected with uh, bees, which are interconnected with our crops and our food and our wildlife. And so it's, we're all together. We're all in it together. And that's really what the, the mission of the Wildlife Federation is to help people understand what they really can do in their own properties. What's fun is that I get to do that from a volunteer standpoint, then I get to do it from a vocation as well. But one of my favorite bands, The Grateful Dead, have a lovely song called Eyes of the World. So the, that uh, quote at the bottom is really a, a fascinating thing they came up with you know, a bunch of years ago uh, in terms of the wake up to find out that you're the eyes of the world. And this is a little bit of that. So hopefully I'll uh, entertain you and also enlighten you a little bit. All right, show of hands, how many people know the word fiduciary? All right, got a few folks. Uh, you might know it from, uh, from a financial standpoint, right? All right, so it basically just means someone who is responsible to work in somebody else's best interest. Not in their okay interest, but actually in, in their best interest. So the notion of working in somebody's best interest is that you put their interest ahead of your own, right? Like so. We've got a family coming in, right? Uh, hopefully mom and grandma have the child's best interests ahead of their own, right? You don't leave the kid home alone without any food, you take care of them, and maybe you don't go out that night. So you put their interests first. Well, the reason they call, do you guys know why they call dogs Fido? All right, excellent. I knew I was gonna teach you guys something today. It may not be about invasive plants, but the reason they call dogs Fido, it comes from Latin, the, the Fido, fiduciary fidelity, Fido, dogs will lay their lives down to protect their, uh, their owners, right? Uh, cat, not so much, you don't call cats Fido. They're like, you're on your own. Well, this is my daughter, Katie, a bunch of years ago. This is our uh, trusty dog, who unfortunately is no longer with us. She's a wonderful pooch, this is Rose. Rose was a therapy dog, but she was super protective, and sweet as could be. We took her to nursing homes and children's homes, and whatnot, and, uh, but she would lay her life down uh, to protect uh, Katie and, and my family. But fiduciary, we have a fiduciary responsibility to each other and to our planet. Um, so the idea of the reason they call dogs Fido is that they, are fidel they have a fidelity to us. So that's really the theme of everything that we're gonna talk about today and why, why I do what I do. So we're talking about native plants by way of talking about invasive plants. So uh, native plant simply means plants that have been here a while. And so the common thought is that before European settlers came a few hundred years ago, those are native plants. Everything that we brought over since then, those are invasive or species in general, not just plants, but also animals like European honeybees, right? So uh, what we get honey from are European bees. Those are not native bees. Uh, so all native species, I focus on plants in this presentation here tonight. Uh, so the, the, the opposite would be exotic species, which are plants and uh, whatnot that have come here since. So they've been introduced in some manner. Uh, so you got a picture of dandelions and, uh, and uh, clover over here, not native, but these are actually not bad ones. Uh, you've got invasive exotic plants. Now that's really what we're here to talk about today, which are the invasive plants. Those are the problematic plants. You know, just because a plant is not necessarily from here, it doesn't make it bad on the surface. The problem arises from when they become invasive, they, they cause more, a lot more problems. So how'd they get here? Of course, um, everybody knows about kudzu, right? Um, 
By the way, you can eat kudzu, and there's a group in Asheville that's trying to teach people to go out and harvest. We've got plenty. Um, you go anywhere, anyone who's got kudzu on their trees and on their property would be glad for you to go out there and harvest as much as you wanted. But they're teaching people how to actually cook with it. So in other parts of the world where kudzu is native, right, Asia, they cook with kudzu. Well, I'm pretty sure that no one here has ever eaten any kudzu. But that's a problem with these plants. Not only do we not eat them, but no insects eat them. A lot of you know, animals don't eat them. Deer turn their nose up to them. So the way they've gotten here is we've either brought them over, um, it, kudzu being an example that we brought over to try and help with erosion control. It worked great for erosion control. The only problem is it didn't stop. It just kept on going, right? And just took over forests and it took over everything. Um, they might have accidentally come here. One example are some packing material. There's grasses that uh, have been used as packing material. It was, you know, you ship something over, pottery and whatnot, and they didn't have styrofoam back then, so they'd wrap it in a bunch of grasses. Well, those grasses had seeds in them, and then we, you know, took those things, threw them in a compost pile, or got them out, and well, or they came over in the bilge pump of a, of a ship, something like that. So they've come over here a lot of different ways, mostly because of us, right? Um, but here's the problem with them. Again, the plants themselves are not problematic. The insects, they're not problematic until they become problematic. So the big issue is they decrease plant diversity. And the way they do that is kudzu, good example again. Um, I'll show you a bunch of different plants and, and you'll probably recognize some of them, you may not others. The big problem with them taking over is that they simply uh, compete and outcompete uh, our native plants. With that, then those plants that deer and other insects used to eat, well, those plants aren't there anymore. So you end up turning a forest into basically a desert for wildlife. Um, and of course, problematic. You drive down the road, you see, you know, this forest just being just tangled up in, in wisteria and kudzu and, and other invasive plants. So here's where it really becomes an ecological problem. So birds, they themselves, a, a grown bird can eat seeds, no problem. But to raise their babies, they need really soft, squishy insects. Caterpillars in particular, a lot of protein, they're very soft. You've seen birds feed their babies, they just cram it down there, right? They don't look like they're just very gently, not the way you used to feed her. Um, so with that, they need a lot of caterpillars. Caterpillars, um, of course, eat plants. Well, if they don't have the right plants, you know, kudzu, those leaves are absolutely perfect. These cat our caterpillars don't eat kudzu. So we have had a very quick, in 50, 100, 200 years, we've changed a lot of the plant species, but we haven't imported all those insects. The problem with some of those insects, we know we have those are problematic too for our native plants. They kill, like the emerald ash borer. Cute, beautiful little green uh, insect, but it kills all our ash trees. You know, these blights, so you don't want to import a lot of stuff because diseases and insects come along with, you know, with the problem hosts of their own. But what they need is a whole lot of these squishy little caterpillars to have more babies, to have more birds. So we've seen a massive decline over the last 50 years. Um, another uh, article talking about uh, global insect decline. Now, that also has to do with the fact that we use a lot of chemicals. Um, we have a lot of problems uh, with, uh, with people going to, to the big box stores and buying something and then just spraying away, right? Um, because they can't have even one weed in their lawn. And that gets into our rivers and our creeks and our waters and all the less. But we're going to talk about invasive plants. So I don't know if you recognize any of these. Uh, of course, English ivy, wisteria, those everybody knows. Sadly, you can still buy those. In fact, you can buy almost all of these, um, which is really sad because these are very problematic. If you go into the woods, you'll see pretty much all of these. And these are woods that, you know, no one's planting them. They don't need to be planted. Birds eat the berries off of these. They fly along, they poop, berries come, the seeds come out, and then we have a whole lot more of these. And then they're very prolific, and they're very difficult to, uh, uh, to kill in terms of just by nature. And sadly, um, goats, 
deer, they don't like eating this stuff. So um, we need to, uh, starting with one of my least favorite, most favorite. So wisteria, so Asian wisteria is absolutely beautiful. It smells gorgeous when it's blooming, even when it's hanging all over the trees, right? The beginning of spring, you guys see this thing everywhere. It's stunning, it really is beautiful. Until it's not beautiful and it just eats up our forests. So when it's blooming, you know, here you can see it, but of course it's only blooming for a short period of time and then it just tangles and grows at an alarming rate. I mean, this stuff can grow a couple of feet in a month. So you know, it's arguably the same as, uh, as kudzu, although kudzu is easier to kill than this stuff. This sends tons of roots in like a zigzag subway pattern under the ground. Um, it's very challenging. This is my arborist, Tobias, and we're at a property. What he has his hand on is actually wisteria vines. Um, they become trees. They are huge. Nothing eats them. We don't have boars for them. Um, and this is at the base of a beautiful giant willow oak in downtown Charlotte. And you could not even see this tree. And the tree was probably a good, uh, I mean, I could get my arms halfway around it. So I think two of me could get my arms around this tree. It's a beautiful, huge tree. You didn't see the tree. And it was probably 65 feet tall. Yeah. How old do you think those vines are? This probably not even 15 years old. Wow. Yeah. yeah, this stuff is massive. And, so, and, and this is on a eighth of an acre, smaller than a quarter of an acre. And, uh, We've been at it for two years, getting rid of, we got rid of the top stuff, it's easy. Well, it's hard work, but that's the easy part. Um, you just cut it and then everything above it will eventually die. But it's everything that's now in the ground, they have all the root systems that, well, you kill the top, well, it's just gonna pop up. You kill it again, it pops up. So without using chemicals, it takes longer, but I'll, I assure you that as long as you're stubborn, and I'm gonna assume a number of you are, you can out stubborn these plants because you will you will go ahead and uh, as long as you cut them one more time, they will exhaust their resources that they have in their roots. But you got to just stay on it. You can't let them, you know, replenish their resources. You got to clip them, clip them again. Obviously, herbicides are very effective at taking care of some of these. Not effective at all at some of them, which is very sad. Also, so there's some plants that you might kill the top growth, but you didn't kill the plant. You actually have to dig it up. Wisteria will succumb eventually. Um, we do have a native wisteria. And so the difference between the uh, Asian wisteria and the native wisteria is that the, uh, the primarily it's much smaller. The, uh, the native wisteria, not only is the bloom much smaller, it's about the size of an acorn or so. The bloom on Asian wisteria, it could be uh, longer than a foot and they dangle, they're much bigger, and of course they get 50, 60, 70 feet tall on the tree, whereas the native wisteria does not get nearly that big. It's more bush-like, really. Um, sadly, Home Depot doesn't sell the native one, but they, for many, many years, sold the invasive ones. So, here's another nasty one, um, but beautiful also. We've got porcelain berry. So the leaves are deeply lobed, and uh, the berries start off green and then they turn all sorts of fun colors, blues and purples and pinks. It really is pretty. If you ever see this, clip the berries and put them in the trash. Don't put them in a the yard waste. We don't, because they'll persist. Um, and it'll succumb to uh, clippings as well as a dab of herbicide. That's really all you need. You don't need to spray these things. Uh, matter of fact, is that part of it is very unfortunate because a lot of people will just spray a vine going up a tree, when in reality, all you need to do is cut the vine, and now you just have a, well, depending on how thick, you're talking about the one Tobias had in the last picture, or this, it might just be a pencil. You just need to dab a pencil, literally, like a, if you're using a, a bingo marker, just a dab, that's all you need to do, of herbicide, of concentrated herbicide on these things. That's the way to go ahead and get them really effectively. When we're doing removals in forests and we have thousands and thousands of feet of this, that's the only way to get it done. We're not going back every week or every couple of weeks and clipping it again and again and again. And here's porcelain berry. It's really pretty until it's not, right? So this is the kind of stuff that you get. Vines do want to take over the world. 
and we need animals that are willing to eat it, right? Um, we don't have animals here that eat this stuff, so this is what you get. Another one is Japanese silk grass. That's a um, real easy one to pull. It's got a tiny, tiny root. Um, you'll probably see these. All of these, uh, particularly like uh, uh, riparian areas near creeks and rivers because it's moist and it's usually on the shadier side. Well, this is, uh, uh, it does just take over an area, but for the most part, it's fairly easy to take care of. Again, you just have to be stubborn. So uh, you can pull it by hand. That's a real quick and easy way to do it. Uh, well, excuse me. It's an easy way to do it. It's not necessarily quick when you have a huge patch. Uh, but mowing it before the seeds get there. So from a, from a practical standpoint, what you're after are the berries or the seed heads. So this one has seed heads. You want to make sure to get it cut towards the end of the season and the summer before the seed heads are mature. Because that's next year's extras right so it's an annual all of this comes back from seeds and it the seeds can persist for 10 years in the ground so you can kill it this year it's a multi-year uh, uh, effort that you need to and most of these just so you know are generally multi-year efforts to take care of um, princess tree uh halloween so real pretty there's it's named after i can't remember uh what country but princess halloween and it's beautiful. I mean, we don't have blooms like this on any of our trees. It's stunning. But it's only stunning for a real short period of time, and then it's horrible everywhere, you know, otherwise, because it takes over. It greens up much faster. A lot of our invasive plants, excuse me, the invasive plants that we have um, green up quicker, and they stay green longer than our native plants. So they get a head start, and then they shade out. And that's how they, that's how they really get a foothold. Not only that, because nothing else is eating them, so their photosynthesis is, uh, their economy, if you will, producing is way faster, way stronger, because they're not, you know, no one's picking them in the knee. So we need you guys to pick them in the knee. Privet, ligustrum, there's a variety, a bunch of different kind of uh, ligustrum. Uh, what we're after are the berries. Unfortunately, all those little flowers turn into all those berries. So if you have ligustrum, um, it is probably, I would argue, the most planted bush by builders. So if you look around your neighborhood, I would argue, with, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would say almost everybody in your neighborhood has at least one ligustrum bush that was actually planted as opposed to planted by birds or animals or whatnot. So the real key is you can let it bloom. It smells beautiful. It's an evergreen bush. It's very effective. You can, you can abuse it and just shape it anything you want and it'll always come back, which also makes it very difficult. So if anything did eat it, nothing does around here, but if anything did, it just pops right back. You can cut it to the ground, it'll come right back. You know? And the plants we want to grow, if you don't even look at it right, it's dead, right? You buy stuff, you spend a lot of money, and then your plants are gone. Well, this guy, and a lot of these plants, you can abuse them, and then they still come back just robust. So let the bees have the blooms, enjoy the smell, their beautiful fragrance, but then as soon as it's done blooming, cut all those off. If you cut all these, you wouldn't have berries. If we don't have the berries, it's not gonna expand beyond your little space. So that's another way of controlling these without necessarily removing them. Removing would be best, but if you've got a big, beautiful green bush in front of your house, you don't want a big blank spot there or start over, just cut all these berries off. Yeah, those stay green. All year long, yeah, it's a great plant. I was very disappointed to find out that it is uh, invasive. And not only invasive, but like massively invasive. So that property where Tobias uh, was holding the uh, wisteria, they probably had 80 trees of, wister of uh, ligustra. And we're talking about, again, probably eight inch, 10 inch base trees, 30 feet tall. So these things are really, like holly bushes are really trees. We just shape them into bushes, but they're really a 30 foot tree, just like this guy. Um, so, all right, autumn olive. If I were to say from a bush standpoint, this is probably the worst one we've got. So the easiest way to, this, to identify it is, in the picture here, you see it's a green leaf and then the backside is quite silvery. It's, uh, it's again, beautiful plant, uh, very successful plant. Uh, the berries are edible. You can make jam and jellies and stuff out of it. Birds love it. 
Uh, I know humans, you can go find Guatemala jellies and jams, farmer's markets, things like that. Um, unfortunately, all those berries make a tremendous amount of Guatemala. So um, one of the things I would encourage you to do, if you happen to have this on your property, eat them before the birds get them, or just trim it to where you don't have the berries. Same thing like with the Lagusha. Funny fact about this one is, the, you don't see it in this picture, but uh, if you cut it, there's a thorny olive uh, that they all look more or less the same. If you cut it, it'll come back, but it'll come back with thorns. So it not only comes back successful, but it comes back to say, all right, so I got predated on by an animal. Now I'm gonna come back and that animal's definitely not gonna wanna eat me this time. Um, so you, that's how you know that either it's been predated on or, or someone has come along trying to kill it and cut it, but it came back and it comes back saying, not this time. So it's a real, it's a real charmer. English eye, everybody's favorite. Um, if you see it, do kill it. Uh, it's a mosquito breeding ground. So you might uh, have a lot of mosquitoes in your neighborhood and you wonder why, because you don't necessarily have a pond or you don't have water standing. Well, this is a fabulous place for mosquitoes to lay their eggs. They only need a teaspoon of water. And these leaves are more than enough and they're multi-layered and they get thick. So, and of course they crawl over everything. Um, they do get heavy. The one decent thing about that vine is it doesn't girdle a tree. It just goes straight up a tree. It'll smother it and it'll eventually kill a tree as well. But not like honeysuckle or wisteria or some of these others. It's just rapid, 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 literally choke out their uh, their their structure, whatever it is that they're climbing on. Um, but it's still not good, you don't want it, you definitely don't want it on your house, you don't want the mosquitoes, and unfortunately, nothing eats it. Even goats, will they'll, they love poison ivy. Funny enough, poison ivy is a native plant, very good for birds, not so good for us. The berries on poison ivy is very nutritious, so it happens to come out right during uh, migrating season for birds which is great until the bird eats the berry, poops out the seed in your yard, and then you have poison ivy in your yard. You wonder, how did I get poison ivy? I've never had poison ivy you know, before. Well, the dog rubbed up against it, and then you cut the dog, and now you've got a rash. In certain places, you may not want rashes. So mowing it down, this is a very difficult one to kill because it's very waxy. So uh, the way to get rid of this is to mow it or weed whack it, hoping that you don't have other stuff in it, like poison ivy. You don't want to weed whack around poison ivy. Um, but you cut it, and then when the new leaves uh, sprout, they won't be nearly as waxy. And that's when you can go and go ahead and give you're going to hit it with any sort of uh, uh, herbicide. That would be the time to do it. I would never just go spray it when it's a mature, waxy leaf like that, because it's you're wasting your money and you're just putting chemicals into the environment. Not going to work. Multiflora rose. So um, this is an interesting one. Uh, we do have native roses. This is not a native rose. This is an invasive. And the way to ID this as opposed to our native ones is that our native roses have pink uh, blooms. This one has white blooms. Uh, but also, right at the base, uh, right here, these look like that. That's not a uh, thorn. It's actually called a prickle. But Thorns are something different in botanical terms, but right at the base of each of these leaflets is gonna have, uh, I forget the, the name of it, but that little, looks like a, a couple of uh, little, oh, what's that term? Ah, I'll get it. It'll come to me about eight slides from now. But that's a way to ID it. Our native uh, roses don't have those, that, those little hairs that are sticking up over there. You can see it a little bit better in a, in a, a small picture at the bottom. But that's what you're looking for to ID a native rose or not. Chances are, though, that in our woods, we don't have our native roses nearly as much, but we have a ton of this. So if you're going through the woods or you have property and you've got a thorny uh, vine that's just rambling all over, usually multiflora rose. Particularly if you happen to ID it when it's uh, blooming, it's white, then it's definitely that. So. This is an interesting one, Tree of Heaven. Great marketing on the name, right? Um, it's really ought to have like the other end, not heaven, but um, the other end. But uh, it's got a couple things going for it. Um, one, it grows super, super fast, and 
and multiplies tremendously. Uh, and it's uh, allopathic. Do you guys know what that means? Allelopathic. Do you know what it means? Right, you know how it does. You know how it does that. Yeah. So it has uh, it. It plays chemical warfare. So it kills. Not only does it prevent stuff from growing, but it actually kills things near it. Uh, black uh, uh, black walnut, uh, which is a native tree, also plays that game. Um, so there are plants. If you have a black walnut tree in your yard, you need to look for plants. That can handle that and aren't, don't succumb to its chemical warfare. So this guy comes at you in a couple of different ways. Um, the way you ID it though is right at the base of each of these little leaves. There's a little bump. <laughs> so you'll notice that you have this little bump where on, on, the, on the other side it's, it's just kind of a little wavy. That's the way. But the the way I do it every time is you tear a leaf and the leaf stinks. Uh, it's got another name, like Stinky Sumac or something like that. That's a better name than Tree of Heaven, but everybody knows it as Tree of Heaven, and I don't wanna give Sumacs a bad name. But, uh, so this guy, uh, it smells kind of like rotting peanut butter, is what people, uh, so if you're hiking along, you happen to see something that looks like this, or if you don't, just rip leaves, smell them, and you get, you, that's a good ID. Um, so, it's a stinky one, but it's 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 also terrible. It's it's very problematic for us. Mimosa trees, beautiful, another real pretty tree. Um, matter of fact, they're folks that will harvest the blooms and make wine out of it. Um, so that would be great if they did that at a much larger pace, and we didn't get all of these seed pods, and we didn't get a whole bunch more mimosas. So. This time of year, matter of fact, right now, mimosas is blooming. Uh, you should be able to see them. Sadly, you'll see a lot of them. Real pretty feathery leaf. Uh, these guys, again, very problematic, super invasive. Who are a neighbor of mine that I finally convinced to cut down their mimosa tree by going across the street and showing them the easily 18,000 little saplings and seedlings of their tree in our other neighbor's lawn. So that our other neighbor doesn't have a lawn. They don't spray, they don't you know, use herbicides or anything like that. Um, they just mow. And if you've looked in it, not grass growing, it's at least a billion of these guys, which is kind of a neat look, but a terrible plant to have. But as long as he keeps mowing it, it's not gonna produce the seed pods. But my neighbors who who had the big tree, the mother plant, if you will, um, was contributing to that. They had no idea that it was just that invasive. So they are. Anyway, a lot of people like it. It does have medicinal value, but we don't use it for medicinal. I mean, how many of you guys have had mimosa wine or food or medicine from it? Yeah, none of us. So where they do that, then they can keep it a little bit more under control. They can actually harvest and cultivate it. That would be great, kind of like the kudzu, but we don't do that, so it goes out of control. Our Chinese bush clover was uh, brought over here. It's a good uh, erosion control. A lot of these plants actually, plants in general, do really well for erosion control. Uh, this one was brought over. You'll see this on the side of highways and everywhere else. Uh, it's got the word clover in it, but it doesn't really look anything like a clover. Normally, you see it with just one strand, uh, with these very, very small uh, little uh, leaves. Uh, super invasive see it everywhere. It's fairly easy to pull out, it's fairly easy to kill, but tons and tons of seeds means that they're back every year with a vengeance. So uh, if you see it, get rid of it. Let's the days out. All right, periwinkle, one of my least favorite also. Uh, there's the vinca major and vinca minor, and the only difference really is that the leaves, one's bigger leaves, one's smaller leaves, and they look the same. You can buy them with variegated tips, meaning that they have like a cream coloring to the, it's not just a green leaf, it's kind of green and, 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 and whitish or creamy. Uh, unfortunately, it's super, it's a great grower. As you can see from these pictures, nothing eats it. So again, the problem that the, 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 the you know, I, I, I'm like a broken record, right? Nothing eats it, nothing slows it down. It's growing out of control, arguably, and 
it just takes over. So where it basically can just smother everything else out, if that's the look that you're going for, it's the same thing with English Ivy. You know, we've driven to buy homes that just have a big patch of English Ivy or some other ground cover like that. Um, but it's, it, it's not providing. And so the big thing for birds, if you think about it, if you're a bird and you, you're wanting to raise some young, you need to land somewhere where you can eat. There's nothing to eat here. So this is arguably a desert. It doesn't look like a desert. It looks green, it looks lush, but it's a desert, right? So if you think about a crepe myrtle, not native, and you think about an oak tree, even if they were the same size, right? I mean, oaks get enormous and beautiful and fabulous, big, huge shade trees, but let's say they were exactly the same size. The oak tree has 400 different insects that it hosts that are eating it at all times. A crepe myrtle has about four. Let's say 20, if that's it. But let's just say 20 insects. So you're a bird, you're looking for food. An oak tree, again, same size, is going to be a full bird feeder. Crepe myrtle is an empty bird feeder. This is an empty bird feeder. Nothing's eating this. So that's really the way to look at the plants that you choose and the, and the things that you do. Um, what you can do, other than getting a great license plate, um, is choosing native plants. That's obviously the theme of what we're talking about today, um, because native plants get eaten. And a lot of people, the reason that we have all of these non-native plants is because the nursery trade would sell it as deer resistant, insect resistant, pest resistant, nothing eats it. Ooh, that's great because my hostas get eaten. Now, hostas are not native also, but at least the deer eat those. But hostas, I mean, if they're gonna eat something, hostas don't spread like crazy. Um, you know, you might get two hostas in a couple of years. Um, they're not gonna take over. So the one thing that the deer actually do eat that are not native aren't invasive at all. Well, in any case, picking native plants but removing invasives, and it doesn't necessarily, eradicating and removing are kind of two different things. So you're trying to be a predator of these invasive plants. And that list, by the way, I mean, I only gave, what, like 12 or so. That list is, is a thousand long. It's not 10, right? So that's no, nothing is remotely uh, like all inclusive here. So there's tons of stuff. Uh, North Carolina Wildlife Federation and, uh, and Forestry Service and a couple of other organizations like NC State, and I'm, I'm leaving somebody out, uh, they had a bounty for, uh, for Radford pears. And so they're going around the state offering a free native tree if you cut down a Bradford pear. And so we had it in Charlotte uh, last year, had it in Greensboro the year before that. Um, and so they're moving around the state, encouraging people to chop down a mature, uh, even not a mature, but just a established tree. And most people are like, well, it's my shade, you know, I don't wanna get rid of it. Well, the sooner you get rid of it, the sooner we stop getting a thousand more of them, right? So. Uh, just because you don't have a thousand in your yard, again, the problem is where it's lands that aren't being uh, handled and taken care of, they're just running amok. Um, composting is a great one. Keep your stuff that's organic material out of the landfill, because you know, your eggshells, your banana peels, all that stuff, you dig a hole, you don't have to dig a hole. Just have a pile of it, just keep piling leaves on top of it. Let the worms and let the raccoons go through whatever they want in your compost pile. They're just helping you out. And if they're willing to eat some of it, drop them. You know, uh, if you want to you have more potatoes, one of the easiest way to grow potatoes is in your compost pile. So if you have a potato that goes a little mushy and you're not going to cook with it, throw it in your compost pile. Next thing you know, you have a potato plant growing because that is the root and it'll just go ahead and make more potatoes for you. So instead of throwing it away, it's actually stuff that you can grow. So compost is a great one. That, if you can compost or buy compost, the counties, um, you know, Mecklenburg County has got a great compost system. It's actually OMRI certified, which is like an organic certification. They have, uh, and it's super inexpensive. Um, pickup trucks are about 20 bucks to fill up a pickup truck of compost. Instead of using uh, fertilizers, you can top dress your plants with compost much better. And the, the, the next one I really enjoy is be a lazy gardener. So every fall, you see tons and tons of landscapers and your neighbors working to collect all those leaves and bag them all up and get them, get them out. It sounds like uh, like 40 people just showed up over there, didn't it? 
Oh, that's at the rain? Alright. Oh, sorry. You can feel it. Uh, so, leaving the leaves is critical. And in fact, one of the biggest reasons that you wouldn't need to use pesticides is if you go ahead and leave the leaves because ladybugs overwinter in your leaves. So every, every time your neighbors are raking up the leaves and they're bagging them, they're literally getting rid of the insects that are going to do the work to get rid of their aphids next spring and next summer. So hang on to them. In fact, we collect hundreds of bags of leaves off the corner. As long as, as, long as they're nice and fluffy and light, no grass, because that's where most herbicides, pesticides are in grass. Most people do not spray their trees. So the leaves are going to have uh, lace wings and luna moths and all sorts of overwintering creatures are going to be in that leaf layer. Um, and we collect it and it makes awesome compost. It decomposes fairly quickly. Um, so I'd encourage you to be a lazy gardener. Don't cut your, your plants too soon. Matter of fact, a lot of plants, uh, they don't grow very well in terms of their little, they're weak. So when you have a thunderstorm like we're having now, um, they lay down, right? Well, if you didn't have to be so neat of a gardener, you would have um, the stems from last year being your structure and your support and your scaffolding for this year's growth. So if you left a little bit, maybe a foot and a half, you know, you get a plant that grows a couple of feet tall, three feet tall, you can cut it down to a foot and a half not only do you have overwintering insects in the stems themselves, but you also now will give support to next year's plant that when it grows and a storm comes along, it's got something to lean on. So being a lazy gardener is fantastic. Uh, you get to enjoy the garden instead of working it, right? And then you get to cre create habitat with that. So putting up owl boxes, uh, bird boxes, certainly the, the being the lazy gardener, leaving the stems themselves. So our native bees will go ahead and they don't build big beehives. They look for little hollows, like reeds and your stems of your echinacea and your, all these other uh, plants. They'll go ahead and drill into that or those from last year are now hollow and that's where they'll create their nest for this year. So leaving your hollow tubes, uh, plant uh, uh, stems will only give habitat to others. So, and of course, Turtles will enjoy having uh, a little bit of cover. So put it, leaving your, your, uh, your branches, not every branch that falls in your yard, but a little pile of branches then has an opportunity for frogs and lizards to find more insects and whatnot to eat. The right plant, right place, that's kind of obvious. You don't plant a big oak tree under a power line because then you know, Duke Power comes along and butchers your tree and doesn't take it totally out. Right? We see that going down the road all the time. Fertilizers, pesticides, you use a whole lot less irrigation. Um, but if you're gonna keep a lawn, mow it real high, you don't have to water it as often, you don't have to mow it as often. But uh, instead of doing pesticides, if you aerate it and put a little top dressing of compost, that's, all, that's everything that you're gonna need there. So compost is full of beneficial uh, organisms like bacteria and protozoa and nematodes and fungus. And they're going to be your, your army, and they're also full of nutrients. Awesome. All right, so what you can do in terms of planting stuff, we'll talk about plants. We talked about all the bad stuff. Here are the good stuff. So a riparian buffer is basically just along creeks, rivers, things like that. Uh, these are some fabulous plants. I've seen a uh, button bush, which is the top right here, growing not just near the creeks or rivers, but I've been kayaking, and it's in the river in the creek with us. So you can go cut some button bush if you find somebody that has a little button bush and just stab it in the mud near your creek and it will grow. That's all the work that you need to do. Um, it's a fabulous one. It can handle uh, not only just wet areas, but just completely inundated areas. So like a, around the, the lake that we have right out here, that would be fabulous. The, Pollinators absolutely love this. So native bees, native uh, butterflies, native uh, uh, wasps, they all come to this like crazy. Uh, it's gonna be blooming here in another couple of weeks, so look for it. Silky dogwood, red, tri red, red twig dogwood, uh, nine bark is the red one over there. Uh, silky willow, weeping willow that most people see is not a native plant, that's an Asian willow. We're talking about uh, salix, so silky willow, that's a native willow. 
Uh, all of these trees, all of these bushes are fabulous for wet areas and they create thickets and they all produce stuff that, uh, that nature could use. Bushes, these are some of my favorite ones. So beauty berry is also edible. You can make jellies and jams out of it. You'll find that. Uh, St. John's work, the, the pollinators go bonkers for, the, uh, for that. There's about 500 different plants in, in the Hypericum uh, family and many of them are called St. John's wort. So if you buy a St. John's wort, look for the native. And so this one, Prolificum, is a native. There are other natives, excuse me, as well. Um, so there's also a, an Asian variety of beauty berry. So when you're buying these things, do look for the native variety of a plant. Ask about that. Hey, what's the Latin name of the plant? And then we can find if it's actually the native variety or the uh, non-native variety. Uh, Itea is also a great one, Sweet Spire. It's got a bunch of different names, like Lizard Tail for, the, uh, for that white uh, way that goes. Here are a couple of my favorite ground covers, green and gold. You can grow it in the sun, you just have to keep it a little bit more moist. Uh, the the uh, uh, Pachysandra, most people are familiar with Pachysandra. It's a great ground cover, but that's the Japanese Pachysandra. That's what you can find out in a trade. This is Allegheny Spurge or Mountain Pachysandra. Uh, that's our native variety of uh, Pakistander. And of course, Phlox, another beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful plant. Some evergreens that we have that are native. Uh, wax myrtle up here. The birds go bonkers for that uh, when uh, uh, in, the, in the fall uh, or end of summer when they produce a lot of berries. They can grow, this is like a utility player. You got sun or shade, you got wet or dry. Wax myrtle is your answer. They can handle it all. So it can handle, it could be a riparian plant too. It could be in a real wet, like a garden, a rain garden. Right now with as much as out there, I'm glad we're inside. I might have to talk a whole lot longer just to stay here. Um, Ickberry is a, is a native uh, holly bush and it doesn't really produce, I mean, these are very small leaves and the blooms are very small. Pollinators find it, but it's one of my favorite because it only grows about five feet tall and then it stops growing. So with everybody else that they constantly have to trim their hedges in front of their house, you plant an inkberry, once it gets to about five feet, it might have one little branch that you, you know, like an alfalfa uh, haircut that you gotta give it, and that's it, you're done. So it stays put, and you, from a maintenance standpoint, pull a lot less. Elysium really likes it more in the shade and a little bit more on the wetter side, more moist. But I've seen Elysium growing in full sun and what seems to be quite a dry area. But that's, uh, there's two varieties. This one uh, blooms more of a creamy uh, 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 flower. And then there's a, a Elysium uh, Floridanum that actually blooms a little bit more maroon, a little bit more showy, also native uh, a type of Elysium. Where you can find plants and you know, what plants there, what should I plant? Those are just a few of some of my favorites, but there are so many more in the palette that you can pick from. Uh, North National Wildlife Federation has this web page that uh, they did with an entomologist, Doug Tallamy. If any of you have not read any of Doug Tallamy's stuff, you've read Tallamy's stuff, uh, the libraries have all of his stuff, not only to, to take out, but also on audio. He's written four books. You can read them in any direction. One is better than the other, no matter how you read them. Fabulous stuff, really interesting. A lot about what I was talking about, he goes into. He's an entomologist up at University of uh, Delaware really fabulous stuff. Well, he helped the, the National Wildlife Federation put this together, and what they do is they score these plants by how many Lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths, they support. So what you're really after is like an oak tree, 400 insects that it supports, as opposed to other plants like cardinal flower, I love it, but it doesn't support nearly as many insects. And if we're really after trying to help, eco ecologically speaking, you want to have your plants eaten by as many plants and as many uh, insects as possible. So what they do is they score these by how many insects are willing to eat this stuff. So when you see insects eating it, you know you're doing well. That's what we're after. Audubon also has a great website. They have uh, plants. They keep adding native plants to their list of uh, good stuff. So you can go to uh, Audubon. Uh, National, the North Carolina Botanical Garden has a great website as well. The bottom is the uh, ncwildflower.org is the Na North Carolina Native Plant Society. 
they have a great website um, to learn a lot about native plants. Matter of fact, in the, in the fall, they have a free seed swap. So it's the cheapest way to get a lot of plants. A little harder, you gotta try and germinate all these seeds, um, but they'll help you do that. And uh, it's a great way to go ahead and, uh, and get a whole bunch of native plants in your garden or share with friends. Controlling invasive, the, uh, the Botanical Garden, North Carolina Botanical Garden, put out this uh, controlling invasive plants. It's basically the same argument for each plant. You clip it, you put a little bit of herbicide on it, you go do a whole lot more. But they give you a little insight on all these. It's a free PDF that you can get from their website. My favorite, uh, when you're researching plants, if you pick a plant and then type in NCSU for NC State University, we've got a great website and it'll be your first hit. So if you were looking for, for instance, St. John's Word, you can just type in St. John's Word or the Latin scientific name and then NCSU as a Google search and the very first link will be to NC State's write-up on that plant. It'll tell you if it's invasive, it'll tell you if it's toxic. You know, we've got a lot of plants that you don't want to eat, you definitely don't want your dog to eat or your horse or your goats, things like that. Uh, it's a, a, another fabulous resource for us. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Um, these are the chapters around North Carolina that we have. So if you're in an area in North Carolina that isn't represented by this map, uh, we'd love to have more folks learning about wildlife and gardening for wildlife and just being conscientious and conserving our land, you know, and working together. So thank you very much for, uh, for uh, you know, paying attention. If you got any questions, I'm glad to answer anything that you might have. Yeah, so plants play a chemical warfare. They don't taste good. They are trying to have everybody leave them alone, right? Like cactus, uh, they've really figured out a way to keep people from, and, and just animals and insects from eating them, because you're not going to take a bite out of that. Um, so other plants have figured out, hey, if we just taste really bad or we have poison, like milkweed has a whole bunch of nasty stuff in it, and it's sappy, uh, some plants have figured out better ways of doing it, and then the insects that have evolved with them for millennia have figured out a way to get around it. So they have enzymes to be able to digest those plants. These plants that are invasive have only been here a couple hundred years, right? European settlers, we hadn't been here all that long. So in a real short period of time, we brought all these plants over, and insects haven't figured out how to get around. They haven't evolved to, to, uh, to eat them. So, not only, okay. So the, the question is if we can hybridize them to, together yeah. with native species so they become more palatable. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, there, it's, it's Frankenstein's you know, workshop out there. Um, I'll give you an example, the calorie pear, the Bradford pear. Yeah. That's a good example of a Frankenstein tree because uh, the ones that we plant are supposed to be sterile. They don't produce berries and they don't, you don't get like 50 of them around your calorie pear. You buy the one, you plant it, you get one. The problem is they crossbreed with other ones and then they produce a real Frankenstein tree that has thorns that are like this long yeah. that can pop tractor tires. So then how do you get equipment into an area to get rid of them? Or if you're a farmer and you're taking, you know, those tires are insanely expensive. So crossbreeding is, yeah, you're, you're rolling the dice. You're playing Vegas on doing something. Like like right. Well, and, and you know, the problem is that people say, hey, you know, I planted this plant and it's doing fine. It's not invasive in my yard. The problem is it escapes that. Yeah. And so these guys, they jailbreak all the time. Um, it's like, you know, Jurassic Park. It's great if it stayed just there, but unfortunately they break out and you have that problem. So that's, that's kind of the same thing. Who else? I know you got a question. No, I'm just curious if, uh, Seems kind of far out there, but is there any like legislation or people like talking about like we're kind of talking about like continuing to sell these invasives? Like, is there any kind of movements against selling at local nurseries these invasive plants? Like, that seems a long thought battle. Yeah. 
so I'm glad you asked that. So the question is, are there any legislation? Is there anything that can that we can do to, uh, or that is being talked about, yet, um, to stop propagating them and selling these plants and getting them out there? So we spend in the United States something to the tune of like 30 or 40 billion dollars treating and dealing with invasive plants, from our aquatic plants, right, like hydrilla that clog up lakes and things like that, to all of these that we talked about. Um, when you start telling someone that they can't make money in this country for, you know, propagating a plant that they can sell, and everyone wants to buy Ligustrum, every home builder buys tons of them and plants tons of them every time they build a house. Uh, landscapers buy it because they know it. It's a bulletproof plant. It's terrible. It's a bad plant here. It's wonderful in Asia. Bad here. Um, you end up with a hot potato that people don't want to touch. The, I believe Delaware, Maryland just came up with an invasive plant list that they made it illegal to go ahead and propagate and sell these plants. And they have a list. But that list is kind of short, but it's a start. It's a wonderful start. Um, North Carolina legislature uh, is not interested in, in that. They won't, they won't pass you know, cannabis. Um, which many states are making not only a lot of money, but you know medicinal valleys and all that. But they'll let you do this, where then our tax money has to go then to fight this. So again, you can still buy a lot of these just at nurseries that are out and open, not like just mail order stuff. But the mail order stuff is even worse because you got someone easily propagating a lot of these and then selling it to folks online that they don't know. At least there is, there is a movement now. Enough people have complained to the big, big box stores that you're seeing more and more native plants at the Home Depots and the Lowe's. Um, so that's encouraging. Unfortunately, uh, not nearly as much, right? So, um, and whether they continue to spay them with pesticides, like I'll give you an example of a, a native plant that I didn't mention, but it's a real mm -hmm. strong one is milkweed. So it's the only plant that the monarch butterfly lays its egg on, right? Uh, you can go buy milkweed at some of these places, and then you look at the tag, and it's been sprayed with pesticide to keep the insects off of it, so it looks really beautiful for when you show up and buy it. Well, unfortunately, that stuff sticks with it, and some of these neonics um, actually go into the plant. There's not like a little surface protection, and so it makes the plant, uh, it literally it poisons the plant for the thing that you, you do want insects, not just monarchs, but there are a lot of their aphids that will uh, be on milkweed. There, uh, there are a lot of other, uh, like their milkweed bugs are actually called milkweed bugs. Little ones, big ones, they're red and black, really pretty. Well, there's a whole ecosystem for these plants. And so when you go somewhere and now they're sprayed with insecticides just to make them really, really pretty for when you go there and buy them, because people don't want plants that have chewed holes in it. But I get ahead of myself. The fact of the matter is, it's a good step that they're now offering some native plants. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it's the people that we vote who make these policies on a statewide you know, basis, they don't really have an appetite for saying no, that you can't do something to make money. Um, so be a squeaky wheel, I tell people that all the time. Um, make phone calls and complain about that kind of stuff. You get enough people to complain, and of course, you know, vote. You know, vote for folks that have better environmental policies. Well, they have a lot of HOAs even, you know, say this is what you can grow in your front yard and they're all in, not invasive, but you know, a lot of them are not native. Right, so you bring up a great thing, HOA. So HOA is a big problem because they make you have a weed-free lawn and they make you only have a certain type of yard. You can't have a, let's say, a, a prairie in the front yard. Uh, which would not only have more bees and insects and frogs and lizards and everything else, right? Um, you can fight those, and uh, thank goodness here recently the Supreme Court uh, actually sided with people against HOAs having rules that did indeed overstep. So the fact is that you only win battles that you will in a fight, and so the more noisy crickets we all are, and we go and we're willing to fight that and buck the system, um, that's really the, the way this, this kind of stuff you know, happens. Groups like you know, Catawba Riverkeeper is a good example. Uh, 
I, I don't know a noisier cricket than Catawba River people, you know? I mean, they're going after our biggest polluter in the area is the people who give us our, our power, right? And all the things that they dump into our, into our, into our waterways, um, you know, no, you can't come over here, you can't see it. Well, we're gonna send folks out, we're gonna go look, and we're gonna test it right back here. And so holding those folks accountable makes that change, but that's a battle and it's not a pleasant one many of the time. So the answer to your question is you can fight your HOA, not on everything, but you can fight HOAs. You become uh, you know, a member of the board of the HOA and then you get enough people to then vote in a different rule that now, now the HOA says you can. Um, so the problem is that they, you know, a lot of HOAs think of it being messy. Like the gardening that I do and the gardening that we promote can look messy. And that, you know, we talked about being a lazy gardener, leave the stems, leave the leaves. So they, they, it appears that you're a messy yard. And, oh my gosh, your messy yard is going to affect my property value. So that's, a, it's a mindset that just needs to change. The lawns are a mindset that needs to change. Anybody else? Well, you know, it's like That's right. Yeah. So again, I mean, that's kind of like on the noisy cricket side. Is that groups like this and Audubon and Sierra Club? You know, they they've got their problems, but they're also doing. You know, the, they're fighting the fight, which is is you know getting rid of ignorance on a topic. And then once you know, then go and share that with your neighbor. Teach them about native plants versus non-native plants. You know, find a nursery that has a native plant. Like uh, right now, what's blooming all over, which is wonderful, is, uh, uh, or as soon as I say it, it escapes my, uh, my head, but elderberry. Elderberry is growing and blooming right now. It's got these nice, big, fluffy, white tufts of, uh, of flowers. And you, know, you can harvest that, make syrup out of it. It's a great native plant. Matter of fact, that's also another one that does really well. You cut a cane of it and stab it in the, in the dirt if you've got a creaky or, or a, a, a wet area in your yard. Um, then you really don't have to t take care of it, arguably, at all. But if you have a, a rain garden, go create a rain garden, you can put it there. Or you can just plant it and take care of it a little bit. You've got to water it a little bit more. If you've got a drier area, it'll still do just fine. But in wetter areas, you literally can just drill a little hole, stab it in the dirt, stick of it, and you'll have more of them. So, um, so pay attention to where they are now in, in your area, and then go back after the, all the berries are off of it, you can go harvest yourself some, some canes of it, uh, you know, help that person out, particularly if they give you permission, um, and uh, you know, help trim some of it, but then you can propagate it yourself. But I love the idea of getting out Volunteering with organizations like this, we do invasive plant cleanups all the time. So if you guys are willing to come to Matthews, um, there's, a, there's a Gastonia chapter of the Wildlife Federation called PAWS. They do uh, stuff so that's a lot closer to you guys. Um, there's a Lake Norman chapter, there's a Charlotte chapter, and like I said, we've got new chapters all over. But um, we do invasive plant cleanups, and we need to do probably 10 times as many of those. Um, so. Listen, I thank you guys very much, and I'll stick around and answer any other questions that you guys might have.